It is an honor for me to have these two particular uh, guests this evening at Chevalier's, the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles, uh, one that has suffered the loss of uh, one of our beloved uh, employees in the last uh, week or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've uh, had the community rally to our support. And uh, when I heard that, um, that Rhonda Byrne had a new book out, uh, The Greatest Secret, um, I thought, boy, what could be uh, a better um, moment in time to have this wonderful and important and incredibly best-selling author uh, <laughs> to discuss uh, her new book. And when I thought about who would be a great interlocutor uh, in a book that's really about the material um, world transforming into a spiritual world uh, where all possibilities exist, fears dissolve, uncertainty and anxiety and pain go away, who better than one of the most famous and best known trial lawyers uh, in the United States, uh, my friend, Brad Bryan. And people would wonder, gee, what is the connection other than of course, Brad's um, being so famous for being so spiritual. And it is uh, that Brad in his real life <laughs> Uh, when not being when not being spiritual, uh, served as a trial lawyer for Rhonda and won for her a very very important um, case. But for me, um, it's really uh, uh, a thrill to have my dear friend Brad and uh, this person uh, Rhonda Byrne, who I've admired so uh, long, together um, at Chevalier's, even if remotely. So uh, thank you uh, both for being here and I'll turn it over to Brad for his uh, cross-examination. <laughs> Thanks, Bert. I, I doubt it will be a cross-examination, but it, it, you know, I'm thrilled to be here tonight uh, at Chevalier's Bookstore talking to my good friend, uh, Rhonda Byrne. Um, before I ask her about uh, her latest book, I wanna just, just say a few facts about her because not only are, are her books extraordinary, but her personal story is truly extraordinary. Um, she was born in Melbourne, Australia. She was a very successful radio and TV producer. She had some difficult emotional experiences in the 2000s, uh, and she began studying um, the law of attraction. That led her to write uh, The Secret, well, first to make a DVD, which has sold 6 million copies. Uh, <laughs> she turned that into the best-selling book, The Secret, which has sold 30 million copies, has been translated into 50 languages. Um, she appeared on Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, and following The Secret, of course, she came out with um, The Power, The Magic, uh, Hero, and How The Secret Changed My Life. Um, and she's now come out with what I think may be her most thrilling book, uh, The Greatest <laughs> Secret. <laughs> uh, which I had the pleasure of finishing last Friday night. And I, I, I literally couldn't put it down. Uh, and, and Rhonda knows this because I sent her some, some notes. I, I, must, I must have taken 30 pages of notes of excerpts from the book, which I want to go through here. But uh, Rhonda, first of all, thank you for doing this and, and welcome. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, Brad. And it's so lovely to see you. And, um, and Bert and to everybody at Chevalier Books, it's a real honor to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Well, it's an honor to have you. But before we get into the, the, this book, tell me a little bit about your personal journey. I mean, 20 years ago, you were a happy, successful, maybe not so happy, successful radio <laughs> and TV producer. And now you're a world famous, best-selling author. How did that happen? Well, it all kind of happened in 2004, but if I look back, you know, even in the few years leading up to it, I mean, I was leading a life I think that many people lead, you know, I had lots of stress and uh, um, lots of difficulty juggling money coming in, money going out and uh, various health things and relationship things. So just, you know, kind of like most people, you know, going sort of from one sort of problem to another and moments of happiness and so on. And then in 2004, my father died really suddenly and he was, he was young and my, my parents um, fell in love with each other at first sight. And, and so it was really, really tough for my mother and she was grief stricken. 
And that year I was making six movies for television about murder. Can you imagine? Unsolved murders. And so that was a really, really tough subject. And so that year, everything that could go wrong went wrong after my father died. And obviously I was grief stricken and I was concerned about my mother. And so I, I was, everything went wrong with the films that I was making. I was sleeping on edit suite floors. I was, and I reached um, the 9th of September and, uh, and I was utterly exhausted and the phone rang and it was my accountant who said, you have gone over $2 million over budget and you are going to be totally wiped out in 30 days and you're going to lose everything and uh and uh, that was just like wow and I hung up the phone it was the most extraordinary thing I hung up the phone and it rang immediately it was my mother saying she couldn't go on anymore without my father and and so I had been somebody who just fix things all of her life. If there's a problem, I can fix it. I can solve it. But these things, I could not fix these things. These things were huge. And so I talked to my mother for a while. And so until I knew that she was fine, she lived quite a, a long way away from me. And I said to her, I'll be, I'll be going to see you in the morning. And so after I hung up from her, I absolutely collapsed into despair. I, I was just I was exhausted. I had I didn't know where to turn, and I was just sobbing really. And one of my daughters saw me, and um, and asked what was wrong. And I just said, "Oh, you know," I sort of brushed it aside and said, "Oh, a few things." And um, and she disappeared. And she came back and she handed me this crumpled up, uh, photocopied paper with a bulldog clip on it. And she just said to me so nonchalantly here, read this, it'll help. And the extraordinary thing is I read it. I mean, I, did, I had the whole, I, I was like the whole world was collapsing, right? But I read it. And, um, and I can remember the te my tears hitting the paper and the ink running as, as I was reading it. And, but 90 minutes later, it is a small book, 90 minutes later, my entire life had changed. And that book is called, it was a book written in 1910. It was called The Science of Getting Rich. And it was written by Wallace Wattles. Now, it was the science of getting rich in life, in every aspect of life. But when I read that book, I just seemed to, it's like there was this massive download because I just seemed to know things that I never knew before. And I've really felt that they're all in the book. But then they weren't really all in the book. So, but that was the book that was the spark. And from that book, then I went, um, then I just traced this knowledge back through history. I sort of went from one book to another to another. And so I spent the next three months researching. I called my accountant and I said, I have discovered something incredible. And, um, and all I need you to do is just keep my company alive because I'm going to make something that's going to change the world. And you know what? He totally believed me and he did exactly what I needed him to do. <laughs> and, um, and so I did research for three months and then I went into my team and I said, we're going to make, uh, we're going to make something incredible. And, uh, and, and so that, that was that. And then it kind of, kind of started from there. And so really when we were making the documentary, I was living the principles that I had learned. And, uh, and, and I lived it in so many ways, in e every possible way. My life was, I, was unrecognizable. You know, I just, my whole life turned around so fast, like immediately I started gratitude massively because that was one of the things in the science of getting rich. And I just think like gratitude, if you wanna see your life change, your life will change in 24 hours, your life will change in 48 hours if you just start being grateful. So, and so then all of the other principles of visualization, which you and I have talked about, and that became a really big part of my life. And so, and so that was, you know, my journey to the secret. So I was really somebody just like everybody else, you know, um, uh, getting caught up in negativity, talking about things I didn't want and not anymore.
not anymore. I, I, I just, I talk about what I want. <laughs> so Ron, I once, I once met a man, I guess in his mid fifties, um, and, I, and I asked him uh, if, if he'd read your book and he said he had read your book. And I said to him, how recently? And he said, well, this morning, in fact, I have a download of the book in my pocket mm -hmm. and, and I read uh, a, a chapter of the book every day. Uh, and it's not always the same chapter. Uh, and I gather that that's, he's not the only one like that. Why, why do you think your books have resonated with so many people around the world in that way? Well, the first response I would say to that is because it's the truth. Um, it is the way the world works. It is the way everything works. And and all of those people who've used the principles, they know it for themselves. So all I can do is share and then say to everybody, you have to know through your own experience, um, not, not in believing me, but through your own experience, because your own experience is all that matters. And so people, people followed it. They did, they, they've done every, everything you could ever imagine with the principles, really incredible things, miracles miracles we've got something like 25 30,000 stories on our website that are that are absolutely breathtaking so so i i just it 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 doesn't fail um it doesn't fail we're the only ones who could fail who can who can fail the principles but it will never it will never fail us it will never let us down and it just fr the freedom from this the freedom to be able to know what to do in a difficult situation, to know how to, how to handle it, to know how to go after your dreams. You know, instead of saying things like, well, you know, I would love to be this, I would love to do this, but uh, I'd love to be a lawyer, for example. I'd love to be a lawyer, but nobody in our family ever achieved anything. You know, I've got no hope, you know, I was, you know, I don't have the money, I don't have this, I don't have that. And then, the, the person does have no hope, but in fact, they, they can do exactly what they want to do. You just have to think about what you want instead of what you don't want. And I think in The Greatest Secret, Lester Levinson says, if you would just think about what you want and not what you don't want, but just what you want, that's all you'd ever get in your life. And so it's quite simple that, you know, yeah, that quite simple. You know, as you know, I, I went through and wrote down a number of excerpts, but that comment, yes. I'm, 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 I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Okay, jump ahead. <laughs> in, in your book, in chapter uh, 10, which is called Everlasting Happiness. I love, the, by the way, the titles. Of the oh, chapter. thank you. The titles themselves are inspiring. But you say that many of us, this is a quote, many of us resist mm. being happy because mm. of suppressed beliefs. And you use examples phrases that people say like act your age or grow up or stop showing off or calm down and be quiet. And, mm. and you use that as a way of explaining how some people, they, they cause others to restrain their happiness. Could you just explain that a little bit? Because I found that fascinating. Yes, yes. Because our, you know, it might be hard for people to, to um, believe this, but happiness is our true nature. That's our true nature. And so if it's our true nature, why, why aren't we happy all of the time? We aren't happy all of the time because we're covering up our happiness with beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. They are covering up our natural happiness. And so when we're children, um, we, you know, when we're, chil when we're chil children are so happy. I mean, they might fall over and have tears and then the tears are gone in a flash and then they're happy again and laughing. They just wake up happy. And that's really our true nature. And so, um, and so if, you are, um, if you are believing negative thoughts and negative feelings, then, you are, then your happiness is going to be blanketed over. And most of the time when we are children, uh, that is when we take on most of our beliefs into our subconscious mind. And we've, we're very kind of open as children. And so parents or other people say things to us and we just take those things on. And, and what, what we've done as children is we've taken, we've 
we've heard, you know, don't be so noisy and calm down and, you know, behave yourself and be like this and be like that. And so what we've done then is we have suppressed our natural, joyful, exuberant happiness. And we've kept doing that in our life. We've kept doing it. I mean, we, it could even happen, I think I mentioned in the book, you know, it could even happen that you're a really joyful person, you go to college and the in group is, you know, the cool group is, you know, they, they all kind of behave in a particular way, a bit rebellious. And so then you kind of squash your natural happiness again. And, um, you know, and these days, you know, if you're really like super happy, people are like, well, what, why are you so happy? <laughs> you know? So we've, we've sort of suppressed our natural happiness. And the book helps you uh, see that and helps you restore that happiness because the, the happiness is not anything we have to go and look for or achieve. We already have it. We have a wellspring of happiness in us, a never ending wellspring that is just ready to explode. And the kind of happiness that I am talking about that is our natural happiness is a happiness that probably many people have not even felt. Like it's a bliss, it's a happiness that is absolute bliss, so. One of the things you you say, well, we, well, we, we live in a society that often measures success by the you know, house you live in, the car you drive, what kind of job you have. And one of the things you said in your book, and I'm quoting, is instead of looking outward to mm. the world for happiness, mm. we need to turn and look inward. It's only in that direction that we will find everything we're looking for. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Yes, and especially because, um, well, as I said, happiness is our true nature. And so it is within us. And all of the material things in the world are absolutely wonderful and everybody deserves to have whatever they want. But we will never, ever find lasting happiness in those things. And we know that because we can get a new this or a new that that we're really wanting, a new car or a new house or a new uh, refrigerator or whatever it might be, the new shoes that we really wanted or the new handbag we really wanted. And the happiness is so fleeting. Like it's just, it comes and it's just gone in a flash. And then we're looking for the next thing that we think will bring us happiness. So lasting happiness, we will never, ever, ever achieve it that way. All of the happiness is within us, all of it, just bursting inside of us. And so we need to look within for our happiness and, uh, and just stop believing negative thoughts. Because the moment we stop believing negative thoughts, we allow all of the happiness to begin to rise up within us. Does that mean it's wrong to drive a nice car or live in a, no. Live in a nice house? No, no, because no, yeah, no, because everybody deserves whatever they want, you know, and um, uh, we're in the material world and we're here to enjoy the material world. And the material world is full of material objects. And so, um, and so they're here for the, for the fun and for the joy of it. Um, they just won't give us lasting happiness. That's one of the, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to look at my notes and read this. One of the quotes okay. is from uh, Anthony DeMello. And you oh, yeah. say, most people, even though they don't know it, are asleep. They're born asleep. They live asleep. They marry in their sleep. They breed children in their sleep. They die in their sleep without ever waking up. They live mechanical lives, mechanical thoughts, generally somebody else's, mechanical emotions, mechanical actions, mechanical reactions. They never understand the loveliness and the beauty of this thing that we call human existence. First of all, who was Mr. DeMello? And, and tell me why, why you used that quote. Anthony DeMello uh, was a, a Jesuit priest, um, absolutely wonderful, wonderful teacher. Uh, I followed his work for a good couple of years. Absolutely love his love his things, uh, love his work. He was very um, confronting, like that quote that you had there. And the thing about him was, though, that whenever he spoke, he always had this smile in his voice. And so he had this kind of cheekiness about him and he could say and get away with anything. And so that that's probably sounds very severe, but uh, but th through Anthony DeMello's mouth, not not at all. But what he is saying is, um, 
what he's saying is, is that uh, people are listening to the thoughts in their head constantly all of the time. And so rather than being completely present and for example, with the person and walking down the street, I'm sure everybody could relate to this, is next time you walk down the street, just see if you are listening to the thoughts in your head, if this conversation is going on in your head, um, or are you totally present on the street? And so that's what Anthony is talking about because what happens is those thoughts are coming from suppressed feelings, all of those thoughts. And so it's very mechanical. Those thoughts will keep coming up and keep coming up. And if we are listening to those thoughts all of the time, we are actually not living our life. Our whole life will just kind of pass us by without us having really experienced it. And so, yeah, that's what he means by that. And I understand perfectly because I can tell you, I was asleep for decades. I, I When I woke up from the secret, that was the very first awakening that I had. It was, you wake up. It really feels like that. Like all of the great philosophers and sages all throughout history spoke about waking up. And when you do wake up, you know without a doubt that I've, I was in a, I was in a dream, I was in my head before. I was like lost in my head, hypnotized by the thoughts going round and round in my head. And I wasn't really living my life to the fullest. And, uh, and so, yeah, so that's what, um, you know, that, that's why I just think, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's important to, to just live our life in the presence, in the present now. And I mean, I, I don't expect people to just be able to do it like that. The book absolutely takes you through that and helps you do that and, and helps you understand the structure because as you let go of negative thoughts and negative feelings, it just will not, people will not believe what will happen to their life. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. You, you say in, in the book that it's your thoughts about a person. Yeah. <laughs> circumstance or an event. Mm. The, the source of negative situations in your life, not the actual person, the circumstance of the event. What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, we always feel um, that when we get upset, if somebody makes us angry, we're, we're convinced that it was that person who made us angry. We're absolutely convinced. Or, or if there's a, a circumstance in the world um, that's made us fearful, then we're convinced that it's the circumstance in the world that's made us fearful. But in truth, all of what we have managed to do in our life is suppress our feelings and so, and so what happens is they're all suppressed and we're kind of like these little pressure cookers and we need, we need something in the world to release some of the steam on the pressure cooker because it's too much on the body. And so there will be a circumstance that will happen that will make us angry and that allows some of the anger to dissipate and helps ease the body and release some of the tension. And we are convinced that it was that situation that caused us to be angry, but actually what caused us to be angry was the suppressed anger that we pushed down inside of us. So you actually, you actually hmm. talk about rather than uh, suppressing negative thoughts, yeah. you talk about welcoming them. Yes. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so one of the things is negative feelings don't feel very nice, right? So fear doesn't feel very nice and uh, disappointment, no, no negative feelings feel very good. And so what we tend to do is we tend to push them away because we don't want to feel them. They don't feel nice. And so we push them away. But when we're pushing them away, we're suppressing those feelings. And so instead of doing that, this is, this feels so counterintuitive, but this is extraordinary. In fact, I would say that in the book, it is equally one of the most powerful, incredible practices in the book, because this will eradicate ne negative feelings forever. 
And I know because I'm talking from experience because it's what I have done. And so instead of pushing away a negative feeling, allow the feeling to be there. So if you feel anger arising, just watch the anger. Just be the witness and watch it and allow the anger to be there without trying to fix it, change it, make it go away, suppress it, repress it, without trying to do anything to it. And one of the things that I do is I welcome the feeling. So as it arises, I just welcome the feeling. Basically, I'm saying to the feeling, you can stay here, it's okay. I, I understand you can stay. And what happens is when you welcome the feeling, so instead of resisting the feeling, you welcome the feeling, it just evaporates just like that. Like it's so incredible. And it's the best feeling in the entire world when you have like disappointment or impatience. Impatience is a big one, right? Most people will feel impatient at some point in their day and just impatience arises and you just like allow it. And even what we say in the book is to just kind of open your arms out like this a little bit so that you're kind of welcoming the feeling and then you just watch what happens it just absolutely dissipates and so that is how you release all of the suppressed negative feelings in our body one of the things you say in your book is that before you um, really went on your own personal journey um, you used to try to uh, overcome negative thoughts by thinking about positive things, which I know I do. I suspect a lot of people on this call do. I uh, do. And it didn't work. Yeah. Tell, tell me why that doesn't work. It didn't work when I was suffering from depression. And um, it works all the rest. It worked for me all of the rest of the time. But when I was down really low in depression and depression's like about one of the lowest, you know, grief and depression, are one of the lowest, and I had had a family situation and somebody was in really grave health risk on one of my children. And so I just had one terrifying thought after another and I listened to them and I believed them. And before I knew it, I was kind of in depression. So I tried really hard to think positive thoughts to kind of turn it around. I knew negative thoughts had got me there. And so I'm like, okay, now I think positive thoughts to get out. But what I found is if you were down really low, your thoughts don't have much power. And they that's for a reason. That, that's for a reason, because if you're down in depression, you really don't want your thoughts to have so much power. If you're really joyful, your thoughts have massive power. And so I just found, I just found they didn't have much power. I thought this is going to take ages for me to feel better. So what I did was I just intuitively um, remembering from the secret what Carl Jung had said, what you resist persists. So I thought I got to stop resisting this feeling. And so basically what I did was I imagined putting my arms around the depression and pulling it into me and it just evaporated. And the relief was incredible, absolutely incredible. And then a few hours later, it came back, but not nearly as strong. And so I did the same thing again. And I did it every time it came back. And in a couple of days, it was totally gone. And I know without a doubt, I will never suffer from depression again, because there is no depression left in this body, none. Another so. really, really insightful thing you say in your book is that you talk about the taking responsibility for everything in your life and not blaming anyone or, yeah. or anything uh, else for something that's happened. Tell, tell us about the importance of accepting responsibility. Oh, it's so, it's so important because unless you can accept responsibility, then if, if unless you can accept responsibility for your life, you, you're not going to have any power to create the life you want. So, you, you know, we really, really need to be responsible for our own lives. And, and blaming and criticizing is just a real trap. It's, it's, it brings us asunder. It really, it really damages us. It robs us of our happiness and it robs us of everything that we want. Uh, in our life, all of the things that we want, great relationships and health and, and you know, what, whatever things that we want, whatever material things that we want. And so it's just a number one thing is 
take responsibility for our own life. And just, and that doesn't mean blaming ourselves or anything. That's just like, oh, well, it happened that way. So, you know, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to write some things that I'm grateful for. You know, it's not, it's not blaming us either, but it's not blaming anybody else. And it's just because don't blame or criticize. Don't judge other people. You know, don't. Those, those things are really, they will just harm your life. They are not going to hurt that other person. They're going to hurt you. You know, they're going to hurt your life. Don't do it. Don't, don't sacrifice your happiness and, and a fantastic life you can have just for the sake of blaming somebody else. In uh, chapter six of your book, which is called Under the Power of Feelings, you talk a lot about suppressing uh, bad feelings, which you've talked about now. Mm. You, you even go so far as to say that letting off steam is not the answer. Why, why not? No, because we, we kind of think, oh, well, if I, if I, you know, if I get really angry or if I throw a few things around and everything, you know, that's going to, that's going to solve things and that's, that's going to be better for my body. But it isn't because when we are letting off steam, we are still suppressing. We are still suppressing and repressing. So the only way to be free of negative feelings is through the process of welcoming those feelings. To do anything else, we are just piling up more anger or more frustration or more impatience inside of us. And, and those negative feelings, you know, they play havoc on our health. They really do. They're, they're energy and they're trapped in the body and they, and they play havoc. That's why when you release a feeling, you just feel really light and you just in, and you instantly feel happy. And you're like, I feel happy for no reason. I just feel happy. Yeah. So. You, um, you, you say in the book, don't expect people, circumstances and events to change for you to feel better because none of them ever will. You'll never be happy if you wait for the world to change according to your desires or your expectations, to change how you feel in any given moment is always an inside job. I thought that was a wonderfully insightful thing to say. Um, Can you just elaborate a bit? Yes. Um, well, if you just think about it, I mean, even if you just think about um, people just think about their partner and, uh, and what things they their partner has a different perspective on completely from from themselves and so that's just your partner so even your partner doesn't see the world the way that you see it and so if you if you needed your partner to agree with you on absolutely everything for you to be happy you would never be happy and yet we still persist on wanting the world to be the way that we think it should be and we want we want the almost 8 billion people to agree with us, to, to not have a different opinion from us. You know, all of you 8 billion, you all need to agree with what I think so that I can feel happy. All of you get into line now, think the way that I think, and then I'll be happy. So you can see it's a lost cause. And yet still, we, we, we have a tendency to do it, you know, still expect everything else out there to change. No. Happiness is inside of us. That's where we're going to find it. And, and, and to pursue that, you advise people to, to question everything. Yes. You say that through questioning, we can discover limiting beliefs we're holding on to that are obscuring the truth. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yes, well, we have all have beliefs um, and they've been gifted to us by our parents, um, by teachers, by society. And most of our beliefs we took on really when we were children and we just believed, you know, what, what our parents had, have told us. And so to be free of those beliefs, we just need to watch ourselves so that and, and listen to ourselves. So when we're in a conversation with somebody and, we, and we'll say, you know, oh, I believe that they should, you know, I just believe they shouldn't have done that. You know, I believe this or I think this or, and if you hear yourself saying those things underneath that I believe or I think is a belief, is a limiting belief. And so just watch yourself. It's so fantastic to catch these things because beliefs are really tricky because we don't notice them because we think they're the truth. 
instead of a belief. <laughs> you know, we think they're the truth. So it's just, it's really great to catch them. And then when you see a belief, you're like, oh my gosh. Like, for example, will I give you an example of a belief? Okay, that I had. So just after I discovered the secret and I was researching, I put on some reading glasses. And when I put the reading glasses on, I, I suddenly stopped and I was like, oh my gosh, I've got these reading glasses because I believed what people had told me. Oh, your eyesight, as you age, your eyesight, you know, gets less and people had said all of these things. And I had believed that to be true. And so I just immediately started visualizing that I could see clearly. And in two days, I didn't need the glasses and I could see clearly. But you see, just that was a belief. A belief that did not serve me. And it's limiting because I would have had to have kept up upgrading the glasses and, and I, don't, I don't wear glasses. And so beliefs like that, they limit our life, you know. They, they limit our life. And so um, we just need to be uh, mindful and watch out for them. I have, I think, two more questions, and then it's probably time for some questions from the audience. One of the things you talk about in the book toward the end is the difficulties that can come from attachments, particularly relationships. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Okay. So attachment is, uh, is not love. Attachment has a whole lot of fear in it. Attachment is, I don't want to lose this. I'm going to hold on to it and, and tight, you know, with a tight grip. And uh, this is something that I will not be happy without this. And so what happens is we bind ourselves really um, uh, and into attachments of things and then we're terrified of losing them. And, and so, but attachment is not love. Love is completely free. Love doesn't have any negativity in it at all. Love actually allows everything to be the way that it is. Love doesn't object to anything. It accepts everything. It accepts every person just the way they are without wanting to change them, without wanting to do anything to them, just accepting them so fully as they are. And so attachment is, attachment is the opposite of that, really. And so attachments can make us suffer you know, because, uh, because they're full of fear. And so we can spend our life being really afraid. You know, I remember with my mother, um, my mother was like my best friend earlier on in my life. And, and I just, I, I used to be terrified of my mother dying because I couldn't imagine how I could live on earth without my mother. And so that was attachment you know, masking itself as love, but that was attachment. And so fortunately, with my journey through the secret and the journey since then, um, that attachment fell away and just turned to pure love. And so when my mother did, um, did pass, uh, I it didn't affect me in the way that it, that it would have earlier. We had such an incredible relationship and... Um, and I was so grateful for everything that she helped me with in my life. And so I was able to absolutely love her, but allow her to leave as well. And, you know, something else that I would just like to say about that is that one of the things I think when we lose a loved one, people feel an incredible separation from that person. That's the part that, that really hurts the most. But when my mother passed, I felt no separation. She is here, present all of the time. I feel no gap whatsoever to her, none at all. Yeah. One of the things you, you do so well in your, your book is to acknowledge the people who have influenced you in your, mm. in your thinking. You're, you're really quite generous about that. Uh, and without getting through all of them, just maybe you can just say to, to what extent have you been influenced by others? And in particular, how much have you been influenced by religion and religious thinking? Well, by the, te the teachers featured in the book, uh, all of the teachers that have changed my life from the secret to the greatest secret. And so every single one of them has 
played such a huge part in my life. Some of them I've, I've followed their teachings for a couple of years and others for a few months, but every single one of them affected me deeply. And they are just the most incredible, incredible um, beings, really, really incredible and, and uh, all agreed so, so graciously without any hesitation to be a part of this book. And in fact, if I talk about them too much, I'll get very teary because they all mean so much to me and I wouldn't be here at all without them. They're just in incredible. And, um, but religions, uh, definitely in my journey, I have um, studied Buddhism and Sufism and uh, Hinduism also a, a big part of that um, esoteric even esoteric Christianity and um, I was brought up uh, Christian as a child and so I sort of had that um, teaching to see the parallels in my work in spiritual work and I can see all of the all of the teachings that I've written about in the secret and in the greater secret and all of my books in all of the religions, um, they all they all speak about the same thing. It's just they use very different words that were appropriate for their time, and it can be hard for us to understand those words in 2020. But um, but all of them are really pointing to the same truth, and that and the truth is magnificent. It is magnificent. The truth really, really, really does set you free. It sets you free from fear, from anxiety, from uncertainty, from absolutely everything. So before I start questions, I want to take, say one thing is just as, a, as the interviewer, uh, you and I shared an experience some time ago mm -hmm. where I can honestly say that um, most people would have exhibited just a, just a, glass full of negative thoughts, criticism, um, and depression, you were the most positive person uh, I'd ever experienced. I honestly, honestly, oh, the most positive person I'd ever, ever experienced. And your gratitude to the people around you was inspiring. Uh, it really was. And, and you had a major impact on me and I thank you for it. So mm, thank that, you so much, Brad. Thank you so much. It's very Teresa, beautiful. Why don't we open it up for some questions? Okay, absolutely. So let's get into the Q&A portion of our evening, everyone. It does look like we have quite the collection of questions. So we'll see what we could get to tonight. The first one, Rhonda, is can you talk about the difference in delivering your message via film versus book, what are the major changes in each mm. approach and what are the pros and cons? Mm. Well, the film is very immediate. What is also wonderful about the film is that we're able to use the power of music to help people really feel and understand the teachings in the documentary. And so, and also to use all of the vision. So we we're able to capture all of a person's senses and really have them captivated. And that's important. So the mind is not going, going, going. And so, um, so that they become fully absorbed. And I just think music plays a really, really big part in that. And, um, uh, and it, it certainly does for us. And, you know, I worked very hard on the music for the secret documentary and also worked very hard on the music for the greatest secret audio book as well, which is, which is an incredible audio book. So, um, and then with, a, with the book, what I was able to do was to include all of the things that I had learned from the secret. And so it became even more practical. I was able to share all of the things, every single thing that I had learned on my journey. And so that made the book really, really powerful. And, um, and also I think with a book is that you have a chance to just stop. You know, if you're reading a paragraph, you can just stop and pause and think about that and be like, or you might be reading something you're like, wow you know, wow, this is incredible. And you can just go back and read it again and just sit with that. And, and, and so that's the amazing thing about a book. And, uh, um, 
and you can have it, you know, by your bedside table and you can open it up. And, and, and honestly, you open up a book and wherever you open it to and wherever your eyes land is exactly what you need to hear in that very moment. So, so they're both absolutely wonderful. I love both mediums and um, yeah, and they have different, just different strengths. Oh, absolutely. That reminds me of um, Brad's story earlier in the evening about the gentleman who would read the same chapter every yeah. single day. Um, so let's move on to our next question. Um, this person in particular, their brother, they're having some trouble convincing their brother about the secret in that their brother believes that negativity actually works for him. He thinks it's a good thing. And that when he thinks positively, things go haywire. So most of the time he chooses negativity. And do you have any suggestions uh, for them to perhaps help their brother find happiness in his life? Well, you know, it's very, um, it's something like that. It's very challenging. I. I would tend to say, um, just work on you. Just do everything for your happiness. Do your gratitude, do your appreciation and let your life take off. And you visualize and you do affirmations and you do all of those things and have your life absolutely take off. And then your brother is going to want to know what exactly are you doing by your example is, and if he would still choose to be, still would choose to be negative, then I would just be blessing him, you know, and allowing him to be the way that he wants to be and love him exactly just the way that he is. Because, you know, a lot of people would ask me um, uh, questions like, what do you say to naysayers um, of the secret? I never came across many naysayers. I don't think I was on the same frequency as the naysayers. But what I have to say to them is absolutely good for you. Because, you know, because everybody has the right to do whatever they want. And, and I write books to share the things that I've discovered that have absolutely changed my life. And they, and they are there for whoever wants them. And if somebody doesn't, that's absolutely fine. Wow, that was the perfect answer to that, <laughs> okay. that question. Um, so here's another one. Um, I've tried to practice your lessons often, but I always find myself failing what feels like halfway through, getting distracted by negativity or consumed by sadness again, and feel like I'm back at square one. Any mm. advice on someone who is habitually unhabitual? Uh, well, I mean, gratitude is always a really, really um, amazing practice to just quickly turn yourself around. Um, but or your question, whoever asked that question, and thank you so much for it, is your question is the reason why I wrote this book, <laughs> The Greatest Secret, because um, you will come to understand the negative side of your mind. Our mind is the, the most incredible creator. It's incredible, really is. We'll create anything. If we follow and we do exactly what we should do, which is ask and then believe, then we will most definitely receive. So it's a fantastic, incredible, glorious creator, but it is also can be our greatest torturer. And it's our greatest torturer when it's dishing up a whole lot of thoughts that really send us into despair or make us feel impatient or all of those kinds. So exactly what this person is talking about. And so in The Greatest Secret, I show you how to be free of that and um, to be absolutely free of negativity. That is the whole purpose of the book is that you, for you to be free, completely free of being influenced and affected by negative thoughts and feelings. Can you even just imagine having one day where you not one negative feeling can come anywhere near you. Have one day where your mind is not jumping onto something and complaining about this and that and, oh, that shouldn't have happened and all of those kinds of things, you know. So just um, 
so yes i i think the greater secret will just help enormously completely um so i i would really recommend that i would really recommend that you read that other than that other than that gratitude appreciation and once you start to because that's what i did i mean with the secret up until the greater secret I basically trained my mind to think positively because your mind is just a computer program. That's all it is. It's just, a, it's mechanical. It's just around and around. And so if you can gather some, some momentum with positive thoughts, gratitude, appreciation, and really get the momentum going, those positive thoughts will stamp out the negative thoughts. A drama might happen and then you might get some negative thoughts and then you just go back to your positive thoughts. But honestly, that is what I did from the secret. I just got my mind to be really, really positive. And I would notice if there was a negative thought and I would just say, cancel, cancel. <laughs> and, then I would, and then I would think the opposite, the exact opposite. So... Um, like, oh, there are no, you know, there are no car parks today. Oh, oh no, there are never are any car parks around here. And then I'll be like, cancel, cancel. There are always car parks for me wherever I go. I'm all, I always get car parks. Everything works out for me perfectly every single day. So I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So short answer is buy the book and then buy the book from Chevalier's books. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's another one um, that I, I, I'm interested in this one as well. So this person is asking, I'm sure you have a ton of these stories, but you, can you share one or two of your favorite stories about people whose lives have changed because of your work? Mm. Well, I know of quite a lot of people who started their business on the secret principles um they've written into me and um companies that are really well known uh today and um and they started their whole company using the secret principles so that was amazing um people who i mean people i've had direct contact with um i've had women who've not been able to get pregnant and um, have been trying for years and years and really kind of desperate and uh, and so uh, and told really that they wouldn't be able to conceive and then have I just kind of helped them a little bit with that and um, and every single one of them every single one of them got pregnant and I get I get emails um, uh, from them it's time it, when the baby has a birthday that they're, they're now five years old and now six years old and um and so they're they're kind of you know they're pretty amazing too but uh, there's one and I was just talking about it I hope I remember it exactly because um it's really an incredible story and is is a woman who really wanted to find her perfect partner and, um, and she was going to, I think, to the business district in her city and she passed a shop with wedding dresses in it. And so she was having trouble finding the address she was going to and she thought, oh, she'd just go into the shop and look at the wedding dresses. So she started trying on all of these wedding dresses and she bought one and she didn't have anybody in her life, no partner, no nothing, but she bought the wedding dress. And she walked out and literally ran into this man, like basically nearly fell over him, tripped over him. And he, she discovered, she said, can you help me actually? I'm looking for such and such a dress. And he said, so am I. And so they went there together. And that man is the man she married. Oh my goodness. I would watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and so that was just uh, like, that story is just so, so thrilling, you know, really, really thrilling. So, yeah, I mean, on our, on the secret.tv website, there's something like 25, 30,000 stories and they're all categorized um, in all of the subjects of relationships and health and you name it, passing exams you know, everything. People have used the secret principles for absolutely everything. Buying a house, traveling around the world for free, getting a free car, um, 
<laughs> all kinds of things. And so it's very inspiring. And we have tens of thousands of people visit the website every day reading those stories because they're so uplifting. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so we are actually just almost at the end of our hour. So I want to get a couple questions in before we say goodbye. Um, one of them is from Leslie and she's asking, you say to focus only on what you want and not what you don't want, but mm. what would you say to someone who doesn't exactly know what they want other than it's not the life they have now? Okay. Okay. That's a good question. Um, and so that person then kind of needs to get clear about what they want and that can be it's interesting because we you know very often we don't know we don't know what we want so the very first thing to do is to ask and so ask make it very clear to me what, what make it very clear to me what I want make it very clear to me what is the perfect life for me ahead and just say those kinds of things um and so basically you're saying to the universe, tell me what it is. I really want to know. I really want to know what I want. I really want to know the best life that I can have. And show me that now and tell me that now and inspire me with that now. And they will be. Wow. So this is the last question. I am using my privilege as a host to make it my question. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so even right now, I saw someone in the chat room say that they were tuning in in India um, and people are oh. also talking in the comments here about how it changed their lives. There's a Lisa oh. who was afraid to fly and now is a flight attendant seeing the world. Oh my God, so beautiful. Um, oh. and, <laughs> and so my question is about, oh. like you talked so much this evening about focusing on oneself um, and self-visualizing. But can you also talk about the power of community that The Secret has brought together, even on your website, people sharing stories and about the power of people seeing other people succeed and, and, and finding solace in others who are on that same journey and how your work has maybe helped bring that about? Well, I mean, it's just so fantastic that um, all of these incredible stories, I love that story of the person who is afraid of flying. Oh, my gosh. There is, um, on all of our social media, the community is just amazing. Um, on all, all of the different platforms and everything. I mean, it's just, it's so fantastic to, how can we reach out to Rhonda personally? I love seeing messages like this. Hello to everybody. Oh, thank you to everybody for tuning in. Um, so on our social media is just so wonderful, the community, um, and it's very inspiring for people and people will post a problem and it's fantastic to see all these, um, all of the people that follow the secret and they all just jump in and help the person and tell them what they should be focusing on or giving them suggestions. And so it's, it's just, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. So... Um, I've got to have a sip of water. <laughs> no, of course. Um, so as we enter evening. Just because uh, my, I got a tickle in my throat then. So, mm. um, yeah, so I think social media and the community is really amazing. Yeah. So join. And um, I want to pass the mic over to maybe Bert or Brad, if anyone wanted to. Hi, Canada. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just seeing all the people. Oh, my God, so lovely. Let, let me. Let me express um, my my gratitude to Rhonda and Brad. Um, your this evening has made me uh, very happy, and the and the dozens and dozens of people I know who have participated, which leads me to what I have been visualizing, which is that each of the people who have uh, observed this will be going to the Chevalier's uh, link to uh, to buy a, an autographed copy of your book. And uh, I can only hope that everybody's life is made a little bit better just by this hour uh, you've permitted us to spend with you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, really, really a moving and important evening for, for all of us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Bert. Thank, thank you. you Bert. Thank you, Teresa. Brad, thank you so much, Brad. So amazing to see you. Thank you. I loved it. 
I loved it. I loved it too. <laughs> Thank Good you. Good everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Good night, Bye. Everyone.